Greetings, ladies and gentlemen and colleagues. I'm so pleased you could join the discussion today. Um, if you all are ready, uh, it's my pleasure to uh, welcome you to this webinar on ensuring access to justice, uh, environmental justice, hosted by the Independent Evaluation Office of United Nations Development Program. This event, uh, uh, some of you might have participated in similar events, is part of our reflection series, which aims to provide relevant and accessible lessons drawing on the program evaluations conducted by the United Nations Development Program units uh, with the intention to support organizational learning. As you know, UNDP conceptualizes environmental justice, including climate justice, as promoting fairness and accountability in environmental matters, focusing on the respect, protection, and fulfillment of environmental rights, the right to healthy environment, and the promotion of environmental rule of law. It also acknowledges that certain groups, especially marginalized and vulnerable groups, often bear a disproportionate burden of exposure to environmental pollution, hazards, and degradation of their living environment. Environmental justice recognizes the interdependence between social equity environmental sustainability and economic development and is a key prerequisite to reaching many of the sustainable development goals. Promoting environmental justice become critical when addressing zero hunger, clean water, clean and affordable energy or climate justice, particularly the recognition of ecological debt. Therefore, the global thrust on environmental rule of law is necessary to ensure that governments respect, protect, and fulfill the right to clean and healthy environment. In this endeavor, I must say, engagement with the private sector businesses is also critical for accelerating environmental justice. To learn from UNDP initiatives that successfully support environmental justice, especially when it comes to progress towards SDGs, the Independent Evaluation Office team has prepared seven lessons from past evaluations. Three of these lessons will be presented by Cassandra Brook, an independent specialist consultant on climate change and sustainable development issues and co-author of the paper. I'm also pleased to introduce Jose Miguel Beltran, who uh, contributed to the paper's development as a co-author. I'm very pleased to welcome Fuad Ali and Ala Ali from the UNDP country program in Yemen, who will share an example of their work in the area of environmental justice at the community level. It's also my pleasure to introduce Tim Scott, Environment Policy Advisor in Bureau for Program and Policy Support, PPPS, who also chairs Environmental Governance Coordination Group, and Sean Connell, Policy Specialist, Rule of Law, Security and Human Rights, also at BPPS. Both of them will share their perspective on the lessons. This session aims to aims for mutual learning and knowledge sharing. So we encourage you to raise issues, share information, and let us know your thoughts on how to strengthen environmental justice. After the presentations, there will be an opportunity to express your opinion in a small poll. You can also raise your hand to speak during the question answer se segment or post questions, comments, or share information in the chat. Let me now invite Cassandra Blue. Cassandra, the floor is yours. Thank you, Vijaya, for that introduction on why we've produced this cross-cutting paper on environmental justice. Um, I'd like to begin by explaining the methodology we used for this paper. So next slide, please, Anna. The reflection series is a rapid evidence assessment. So whereas other evaluation often takes several months to review documents, uh, collect data and conduct interviews, the reflection process is much faster, aiming to rapidly extract lessons from what we already had. <clears throat> so in the case of the present report, there were over 65 key reports synthesized, including independent country level evaluations, thematic evaluations, high quality decentralized evaluations, and the peer review literature. Now, environmental justice is new to UNDP in terms of specific focus. 
uh, last year in 2022, the organization produced a guidance note that defined environmental justice as promoting justice and accountability in environmental matters, respect, protection and fulfillment of environmental rights and promotion of the environmental rule of law. The recent evaluation on UNDP support to access to justice contains an entire section on environmental justice. And it recommended that UNDP should promote more integration and synergy between its justice programming and other areas of work, including health, environment and climate change and that there was a real opportunity for the organization to use its integrated role. So in framing our approach, we considered environmental justice in a broader sense than the judicial legal aspects and looked at how it was treated in different thematic areas and specifically what it meant in relation to the sustainable development goals. <clears throat> uh, next slide, please. So we were able to extract seven main lessons from the evidence. Um, I'll run through these briefly to give you an overview and then discuss three of the lessons in more depth. So firstly, when we think of environmental justice, I think a lot of us think in terms of conflict over resources. And we found that UNDP has mostly contributed to environmental dispute resolution through informal mechanisms. Representation, trust, and culturally appropriate dispute resolution skills can foster more equitable justice outcomes from community level mechanisms. But um, while legal protection is important to ensure people's access to environmental justice, it, without enforcement, it is insufficient. Community support, cusp free institutions, and application of digital, te digital technology can aid enforcement efforts. In the area of health, UNDP has contributed to environmental justice by addressing negative externalities, such as pollution and waste. However, we found evidence that UNDP has difficulty grappling with the power dynamics in extractive industries and other politically charged contexts. Um, environmental justice is not necessarily simple or easily achieved, and we can think about it at different scales. So successes in the area of water and ocean governance show us that impact can be achieved for environmental justice when UNDP's integrator role is coupled with consistent long-term efforts. Climate justice is incredibly relevant and will continue to be so. And the amount and distribution of climate finance has important implications for environmental justice. UNDP is well placed to advocate for greater consideration of the links between these two things. Looking at the conservation SDGs, indigenous environmental justice is a strong theme. And UNDP contributed to procedural justice, mainly by supporting inclusion of indigenous people and local communities. Achievements in recognitional justice have arisen from diverse approaches, such as support for legal frameworks, building the advocacy capacity of these groups and capitalizing on UNDP's global visibility. And lastly, when looking at growth pathways, such as climate resilient development or blue economy, it's important to consider that there are winners and losers and therefore justice implications. So UNDP interventions should consider how struggles over authority and recognition state government's processes. Uh, next slide, please. So if we look at lesson one, while there were some examples where UNDP had provided support to formal justice institutions in environmental matters, there was more evidence for the use of informal dispute resolution, such as community governance mechanisms. And unfortunately, while there were numerous examples, there was a lack of data on outcomes. And that was because the evaluations presented a time slice without tracing the entire dispute resolution process in a way that could have given us more valuable information. What we can see is the importance of representation and trust for dispute resolution. So for instance, in China, wetlands co-management committees ensured representation of Kazakh minorities. In South Sudan, efforts were dedicated to rebuild trust among community members as a precondition to address disputes over environmental resources. And evaluations from places such as Guyana and Yemen noted the importance of culturally legitimate mediation and insider mediation. And we'll be hearing an interesting case study from Yemen following this presentation. Next slide. So uh, for lesson three, Environmental justice is particularly relevant to health because polluting industries or projects with negative social consequences have historically located in areas where affected people 
are unable to oppose development or to properly participate in decision making. UNDP has effectively addressed negative environmental externalities such as pollution and waste. Um, for instance, it partnered with the private sector to manage plastic waste in, in 37 in, uh, cities in India while working towards inclusion, recognition and improved livelihoods for waste pickers. In China, a project on health and waste management for copper production enabled consumers to exercise their rights, which incentivized companies to improve their practices. But in many countries, the power dynamics surrounding extractive industries form formidable barriers to environmental justice. And we found instances of this being an issue for some of UNDP's work. For example, the project on environmental governance in Mongolia achieved many of its aims, but failed to provide the tools and processes to deal with mining in the context of green development. The evaluation of UNDP development cooperation in middle income countries found that there had been a conscious gradual downsizing of UNDP engagements in countries where the mining sector towers over all other economic activities. And some stakeholders interviewed for the independent country program evaluation in Cambodia observed that UNDP shies away from politically charged issues such as land conflict and fighting corruption. Now, a caveat here is that the reflections paper is, of course, limited to what we can see in the, in the written evidence. And we can perhaps guess that UNDP country officers hold tacit knowledge of how to best address environmental justice issues in these circumstances. But this is perhaps not a point for internal discussion. Next lesson, please. So there's a long history of linkages between indigenous peoples and local communities and environmental justice. UNDP works closely with these groups and has promoted procedural justice through highly effective inclusion. One of the clearest examples of this is the Jeff Small Grants Program, where Indigenous peoples, women and youth are part of decision making through the SGP governance structures. In a recent evaluation of UNDP's support to Red Plus implementation, Leaders from Indigenous peoples and local communities indicated that the support provided had been helpful to integrate their visions and concerns in national Red Plus processes. UNTP's work has also supported recognition of justice for Indigenous peoples. For example, through the development of legal frameworks for access and benefit sharing of genetic resources. The UNTP supported Equator Initiative provides its winners with a training boot camp on how to tell their story and positions them in front of global audiences. There are examples of this visibility leading to concrete outcomes for Indigenous people's rights, such as in the case of Indigenous pygmies in the Democratic Republic of Congo. The aim here is to build the advocacy capacities of these groups so that they are able to seek environmental justice without donor support. And last slide, please. So we don't have time to go through the entirety of the report, but I hope this encourages you to read it if you haven't already. Um, and now I believe we're going to hear a case study from our colleagues in Yemen. Thank you. Um, thank, yeah, thank you, Cassandra, for the comprehensive presentation and for choosing the most complex of the lessons uh, for sharing with um, uh, um, colleagues today. Um, uh, I think Ala uh, from uh, UNDP Yemen is traveling and will be joining us anytime now. So I would like to move to uh, Tim Scott uh, for his comments uh, and perspective on the lessons. Thanks so much. Um, and uh, good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, colleagues. Let me begin just by um, sharing how very well prepared this evaluation was, both in terms of process and contents with clear forward-looking findings and lessons. And as we just heard, it, it includes and kind of illustrates the rich diversity of UNDP policy and programming already ongoing in this space. Although, um, as you noted, as we heard just now, it, conceptually, um, environmental justice is, is fairly new for UNDP. In practice, uh, there's a lot of work that's been ongoing that uh, is very really relevant to the space. So in, in the uh, short time that I have, I'd just like to share three reflections that build on the excellent presentation that we just heard. Um, first, um, uh, uh, as we know, UNDP operates in very different spaces in the different countries and communities that we serve. Um, and so of course, uh, always with a view to looking forward on, on how we take these 
um, findings forward. My first point is about the importance of contextualizing this work and remembering the different country contexts and country typologies um, that UNDP is working in. We, of course, are one UNDP as part of a broader one UN, and if you will, a, a one, one world uh, uh, community. In reality, though, we have just as many different uh, UNDPs as we have different country offices that are supporting the, the, the governments and uh, communities and other stakeholders where we work. And in this context, the role of environmental justice in particular looks quite different in, and not to group them all together, but in crisis and conflict and post-crisis and post-conflict and fra fragile country and community context. So um, I, I won't expand on that point, but that's my first reflection. My second uh, uh, point, and this was also highlighted in the evaluation, is the centrality of the environmental justice approach within and across the uh, service offers of UNDP, and of course, in line with our strategic plan and its signature solutions. Um, in the presentation we just heard, um, some of these links were, were mentioned. Some of them are intuitive. They are, I'm talking about the centrality of an environmental justice to our broader governance work, um, to each of our thematic hubs on nature, climate, energy, and chemicals. And of course, the relevance to other um, Th thematic areas of expertise that UNDP supports, including in areas like inclusive growth, gender, of course, um, health, uh, SDG integration, and so on. Um, so to, to underscore, even though it's a relatively new conceptualization and framing for UNDP, its centrality really needs to be highlighted going forward, um, not just in the work, for example, of the human rights and governance team, but really across the work of UNDP in implementing our strategic plan and country programs at the country level and at the subnational and community level. I wanted to spend the final minute of my remarks just talking about um, some of the other things um, that uh, perhaps were not gone into as much detail in the presentation, but are nonetheless quite relevant. Um, we heard examples about uh, the small grants program, about the Equator Initiative, I just wanted to mention UNDP's work on environmental standards and safeguards as one of the core aspects of um, ensuring some uh, procedural rights and some other uh, procedural aspects of environmental justice. So we have quite a well-development policy on environmental standards and safeguards. It's beyond a compliance issue. It's also how we generate better development results. It's not just how we mitigate harm. And my final thought, again, uh, and then I'll give it back to, back to you, is um, you, the, we heard earlier the importance of this work in the context of our private sector engagement. So just to, to uh, underscore the importance of um, our due diligence work as UNDP um, in the fullest sense of the word in ensuring, again, that we are mitigating any potential harm through our important engagement with the private sector when it comes to environmental justice. And beyond that, leveraging these partnerships. And um, I think the presentation we just heard highlighted that there's some a balance here between the very um, high potential for political sensitivity and sensitivity in general when it comes to some environmental justice issues, particularly things around uh, uh, environmental defenders and other groups who are on literally the front lines of environmental justice issues, which which often. Uh, means engaging more with the private sector beyond the comfort zone of UNDP. So again, here, the due, due diligence work that UNDP is doing, in addition to our safeguards work, is quite important in taking the findings of this evaluation forward for environmental justice. Thanks very much, and back to you. Thank you so much, uh, Tim, uh, for uh, bringing to discussion also the uh, uh, environmental uh, safeguards and standards, which UNDP has been supporting for, uh, for many years now, uh, and also the sensitive, political sensitivities involved in engaging with extractive industries, particularly. Uh, now, uh, may I invite uh, uh, Sean Connell, please, uh, for, uh, for your perspective. Thank you very much. Uh, so just a little bit of background myself. Uh, I'm with the actually rule of law, security and human rights. So the, the justice and human rights side of the house and as evidence of the integration, work very closely with Tim and the team in the, in the environmental side of the house. And so I'll just frame my, my very short remarks on, um, on, on, on from the justice perspective. And 
Yeah, the first point really is that the, the intentional framing, and I think that's very important, is that many have said it already, there has been a lot of work going on, but this is an exciting opportunity where there has been a very intentional conceptualization and framing of environmental justice, uh, which we hope is going to spur on lots of more programming and, and more results, basically. Now, of course, that, that uh, strategy, the environmental justice strategy launched last year, is broken down to three key elements. And, and just unpacking those for a few seconds is helpful, I think, in terms of understanding why the framing is so important. The first one is around legal frameworks. And there's been a lot of developments in the last few years, even only recently, human rights council resolutions, general assembly resolutions, and the right to a clean, healthy, and sustainable environment. Now, this has uh, knock-on effects in terms of uh, regional and national legal frameworks. And of course, so now we have to look differently about how we support governments in terms of setting up legal frameworks and, and legal instruments. The second key element of it is, is the capacity development side. And here again, governments are struggling to deal with and, and build expertise within their institutions to deal with very complex issues and the integration of complex issues around justice, climate, biodiversity, loss and pollution. And especially has been mentioned already engaging with the private sector. So this fine balancing act for institutions to manage environmental protection while at the same time attracting investment. So this is a whole new area in many respects, uh, maybe not new necessarily, but with some very important different nuances to the way we uh, traditionally approached uh, this work. Thirdly and finally, and most importantly, I would say, is the access to justice element. So actually where laws and policies and, and capacitated institutions and people, where it actually meets the people that, 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 that need this protection and, and of course to the environment. And here there's, there's a, a whole world of work required to building the capacity of human rights defenders and CSOs in terms of even being able to monitor environmental degradation, because these are in some respects can be very technical issues. Uh, and of course, you know, they play such a key role in monitoring degradation that supports need to be, again, adapted slightly. So basically this framing gives us a whole new way of looking at our supports. And I think this is a very exciting time. Um, the whole integration, second point really to make is on top of the strategy, uh, working with integration is, is really, really important. And actually at the global level, maybe we have a lot to learn from our country offices who are already working very well between environment, governance and rule of law uh, teams. And, and then we, we hopefully be able to, to emulate that and, and, and reflect that in our global guidance. And maybe just thirdly and finally is the practical um, realization of all this. And so last year, um, the rule of law team, the, we, we've uh, identified uh, five pipeline countries to for, for pipeline funding, I should say, for environmental justice uh, programming. And this is as broad as Tim has mentioned. Some of it's focusing on police for detection of environmental crimes, environmental human rights defenders, judges, CSOs, it's very broad and, and, it, and it really demonstrates to us just how diverse this, this very exciting area is, but also how much we have to learn. So our hope is through these five countries and actually an additional five countries who have found their own funding or, or through different sources, we're gonna learn a lot from the ground up how this intentional framing has been useful or how it might need to be improved. And so finally, maybe just to say that we're very, look, very much looking forward to digging deeper into the results of, of the evaluation and also hearing more from the discussion today to see how we can continue to direct our efforts and turn this uh, strategy and this new framing uh, into, into results. So thank you very much. Thank you so much, Sean, uh, for bringing the uh, uh, you know, legal framing issue. Um, I, I think this was also looked at in uh, the evaluation done by the Independent uh, um, Evaluation Office, um, uh, the Access to Justice Evaluation. I think this aspect was looked at. Uh, as colleagues, you may know, UNDP, uh, not so long, but recently also has access to environmental justice strategy, which uh, also talks about what uh, Tim and Sean has been sharing with us today. Um, moving to uh, the next uh, item on the agenda, uh, unfortunately, Ala, um, uh, from UNB, Ala Ali from UNDP, I'm in country office. Uh, yes, I, I'm, I'm sorry, I'm here, yes. Oh, I, you're here? I, okay, great, uh, great Ala. So oh, next, over to you, Ala, for the presentation. Uh, hope uh, your travels are good and you're able to uh, settle uh, settle into the uh, discussion. Uh, yes. Over to you if you're all set up. Uh, yes, thank you very much. Uh, will the presentation will be shared by you or? Um, yeah. Yes. Okay. okay. Very good. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, and so uh, to, I, I will try to focus today on one of the examples from 
from a Yemen country office on economic recovery and development in a very specific context of Yemen, uh, which is a kind of uh, challenging uh, the country uh, passing through a transitional period of um, post-conflict and, and how we, the country office, thought of um, the theory beyond this uh, project that we focus on today to explain um, a, a part of this project uh, objective, which is focusing on environmental uh, justice. Next, yes. Um, so uh, this project um, of um, the ERI project, which focus on livelihood, food security, climate adaptation, uh, contained uh, several um, outcomes, but what's relevant to, to today's discussion is um, the outcome focus on building the capacity of the community and the local authorities uh, when it comes to um, uh, gender sensitivity, conflict, gender and conflict sensitivity, and provide them with the technical tools, how they can actively um, uh, contribute uh, to, um, um, uh, the, to, to play the, the role all as an inside mediator and, and, and communicate in the community to build the culture of the dialogue, um, to have a, a, a proper uh, contribution to um, environmental uh, justice aspect. Uh, part of the activities that uh, support this project to achieve their objective is um, training of trainers, uh, with the specific topics of right-based approach, gender equality, participation of vulnerable groups in conflict mitigation and resolution. Um, also, uh, the culture of dialogue, which is sort of in the Middle East region, uh, it's um, not very properly settled. So this project also focusing on uh, mediation and dialogue as a two main peace skills uh, to enable people, especially the vulnerable group for active participation in the um, um, economic recovery. Uh, additionally, the tools that we used for, for um, prioritizing the needs in the community is developing a community resilience plan and the, commu the th through community dialogue, because we provide them with the tools how to facilitate and run the community dialogues. Um, uh, next slide yes so uh, some of the initiatives and examples that we have in this slide is what's relevant to the environmental uh, justice uh, however there are many initiatives uh, that um, focusing on a different um, aspect in the society uh, this project went through three phases currently we are working on the phase three as the data for phase one and phase two we um, supported 48 in phase one 45 in phase two initiatives examples on the environmental aspect and um, for example rehabilitation of um, pumping units in one of the villages uh, building sewerage network and construction of water tanks so these are the kind of initiatives initiatives where uh, through the community dialogue were prioritized by the community to be focused on. Next. Yes, here we would like to also focus on the theory beyond this um, intervention, why we, we focus on community dialogue and building capacity of the community. They are the, um, the base for the community if we look for uh, their focus and contribution in the at the end in the end for the economic recovery and development um, the context of yemen uh, mainly at, at this stage will not really allow us to work on the institutional change very much because there are um, changes happening on a on a regularly on the rules and regulations so that's why we focus on the micro and meso level uh, at the community uh, and also um, the, the, the theory is focusing on a school of behavior and an attitude change. Uh, but of course the program in, in general, it's a comprehensive program um, on, on a later stage, the institutional change also will be considered for the next phases. Um, so 
this is this is briefly i'm sharing um the yemen country office experience but relevant to the subject of today thank you thank you ala thank you so much for uh, uh despite your travels and uh being on the move joining this discussion and sharing uh important uh, um, experience of yemen uh, uh, community development uh, capacity support, uh, which uh, uh, which had some important lessons for uh, environmental justice uh, uh, progress. Uh, thank you for that. Before we move to the discussion segment, uh, uh, we would like to have a quick poll uh, to get your perspective on on the lessons um, uh, which were shared today by Cassandra Brook. Um, my colleague Anna, Anna is sharing the uh, poll, uh, so uh, please do respond to it. Thank you. Um, thank you, colleagues, for uh, sharing, uh, participating in the poll. Um, uh, it looks like the last sixth lesson on justice for indigenous people and the third one, followed by the third one on power dynamics, seems to be uh, most relevant according to the participants today. Um, thank you for sharing your thought on that. So now I would like to open the floor for discussion. Uh, please do share your views and thoughts also on the lessons um, which you picked up and why you think it's a priority uh, for you and why it caught your attention. Uh, please do also look up for other lessons in the, um, in the reflections paper uh, with uh, further details on the ones you picked up as well. So uh, now I open the floor for discussion. Um, any questions or observations or information you would like to share with, please do raise your hands. There's also a question in the chat box. Okay, uh, would you, uh, okay. Yeah, um, would you like to uh, share this question? Um, Marja? And um, also uh, Yuchro uh, Ognio, would you like to uh, come up and uh, share your Question. Um, Is hello? Okay, can, can you hear me? Hello? Yes, yes, please. Yes, yes hi, hi, I'm Yichiro. So I'm from uh, IMO. I mean, just, uh, yeah, and thank you very much for this uh, interesting uh, opportunity, and uh, it's a great uh, webinar. So uh, there are multiple lessons to be learned and uh, also the lessons that uh, were already learned. So uh, my question is about the, the response uh, to those lessons learned. Uh, did, um, did the UNDP as an institution take any action to address you know, uh, those uh, environmental justice issues and particularly in support, uh, supporting the local people uh, who are affected by the environmental um, injustice what are the tools or the mechanisms or the advice is there any concrete examples um or uh, the the actions in response to to to, to those issues I, I just like i'm just interested in knowing that thank you uh thank thank you ichiro um uh, for that uh can we take a few more questions before we turn to uh, we, uh, it's good uh, we have tim and uh, sean with us as uh, as well as uh, cassandra who would uh, dig deep into some of these lessons uh, to respond to, uh, to that question yes jessica hello good day um I, I just want to add that part of the discussions i'm sorry jessica you're from panama country office and i 
I passed eight months last year with the rule of law, justice and human rights team, developing the environmental justice strategy. Just wanted to mention that for us in the discussions, it was very important to, to also put on the table that most affected people by the injustices we've been talking about in general are the excluded ones um, from the decision-making processes in environmental matters. And that also affects their access to justice. So what we believe, and this is something that I just want to put here in the discussion, is that the rights of access to information, participation, and justice in environmental matters um, known as access rights that comes with the principle 10 of the Rio Declaration on Environment and Development and Sustainable Development are like key uh, fundamental um, like pillars that have to be also like taken into account because we see that justice is not judicializing the well the way the the countries develop their um, uh, their agendas but in general how we guarantee that people have access to information in a promptly in a promptly way because this also tackles and enhances uh, democracy, also access to participation um, in environmental decision making processes in general, and later on that access to justice and not only thinking about, as I'm saying, the judicial system, but also the participation and engagement uh, to promote environmental or na nature sol based solutions since the like um, in, a, in an early in an early manner. So I just wanted to, to put this uh, as part of the discussion. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much, Des Jessica, for sharing um, uh, your uh, question as well as uh, uh, perspective from Panama office. Um, any other questions before we uh, turn for the first round of responses? Colleagues, any one more question to take? Okay. Um, now I will turn to uh, uh, our panel, which is here. But just before that, I would like to clarify that, um, as I mentioned earlier, uh, we do uh, this reflection series uh, to um, synthesize from the evaluations conducted by the UNDP country officers uh, and um, by uh, other program units in the headquarters to pull out these lessons for uh, for program units again in the headquarters and country offices to act upon. Uh, so to Richiro's question, Richiro's questions, I think uh, it, we put across these lessons for them to reflect and, and to take action. Um, but what action they would intend to take probably it's good to turn to uh, Tim and Sean uh, for their quick uh, response to each other's question. And also Jessica raised about access to information in environmental decision making uh, and any reflections from um, again Tim and Sean as well as from Cassandra um, and uh, Jose uh, would be uh, useful as well. Over to you, uh, over to you. Uh, first thing I will come back to you in a bit. Over to you, Tim. Thanks very much, and thanks to all for the good questions. Um, I'll briefly respond to, to a few of them, and, and many of them are linked. Um, so in terms of the question about implementation or taking the evaluation findings forward, fortunately, UNDP has, has, has been active in the environmental justice space for quite some time with our programming. Again, though, the conceptualization is new and very helpful. So, for example, what does this mean in the question about extractive, indus extractive industry, um, which is also linked to the question about environmental defenders and access to information? Um, so, uh, that there are many entry points for taking these recommendations forward and doing environmental justice work. One is more preventative or mit uh, on the mitigation side. So, for in the example of extractive industries, what we are trying to do is um, uh, uh, make sure that by working with ministries of environment and ministry of mining and with local communities and other stakeholder groups, of course, with the private sector, that the threats to local communities or the threats to environmental justice or the obstacles in ensuring uh, that environmental justice is upheld and linked to human rights. Um, it, there's an entire set of programming that UNDP does to um, mitigate the risks of extractives and other types of um, productive activities, other sectors like agriculture um, that are all about facilitating uh, 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 stakeholder engagement, um, uh, putting in place the right policy frameworks 
um, to ensure that less harm is done and more benefits are generated from these economic activities. Um, and in terms of procedural rights, ensuring greater access to information, whether it's through, through community-based monitoring and evaluation or, or different dialogue mechanisms. One of the areas where there's much more room to improve, though, is on um, either the specific case of environmental defenders, and I'll come on back to that in a moment, and on um, access to justice and recourse. Um, it's not to say that UNDP isn't doing uh, much in this space already, it's just a space where we can grow. One of the reasons why UNDP, there is a bit of a gap in our programming vis-a-vis uh, -vis the demand for this type of work is, uh, as we heard earlier, it's the political sensitivity of this nature. So UNDP collaboration, as we know, in country context, we are there, we have a country program with our government counterparts. We are not an independent NGO. We are not an independent civil society actor or think tank. So there's this sensitivity, particularly when there are things that certain parts of governments are doing, which either infringe on human rights or have a, a potentially um, unintended negative impact on issues of environmental justice. And this is very much in the case of specific acts of violence against environmental defenders. Um, it is up to the you know, sovereign, sovereign powers of each state, each country where we work um, to, to address individual cases of abuse or in the worst cases, murders of environmental defenders. And the approach that UNDP is forced to take and it's not one or the other, is to look at the overarching systems of governance, the overarching uh, laws and regulations that apply to everything from natural resource management to um, uh, local area-based development um, to laws regulating um, uh, employment in the informal and formal sectors. And so even though as humans we all want to respond immediately to individual attacks against environmental defenders, often the default position, and it's not necessarily bad for UNDP, is to look at the broader systemic reforms that need to take place in that environmental justice space. Um, let me stop there and, and give it back to you and to Sean. Yeah, uh, th uh, thank you, Tim. Uh, uh, Sean, uh, uh, any uh, thoughts on these two issues? Uh, uh, Yuchiro and Jessica raised. Thank you. Great, great question, Yuchiro. Uh, just, I mean, to, to echo uh, Tim's comments, especially on the UNDP, the work we do globally on the extractives, uh, a, a lot of support going to monitoring and support to, to civil society as well as to institutions to to best manage extractives. But, but just to be very concrete about some of the the, and just to say that UNDP and ourselves do not have a, a, a standalone mechanism that Uchiro asked about, but, but to be clear, one of the strongest existing um, mechanism, effective mechanism, and that not to create something new is, is the national contact point system with the OECD, which has proven to be very successful in terms of raising issues uh, where extractive industries uh, and, and local communities come into conflict. So this NCP system um, really puts uh, companies, uh, it heightens the risk for companies if, if engaged in this type of uh, um, activity by this national contact point being able to raise the issue at the global level. This guide, the guidelines for the national contact points with the OECD, who we work very closely with, have just been revised and it's been published just only a few weeks ago. And so this has again been strengthened in response to what is seen as a worsening of the situation. And of course, the NCPs, as they're called, respond to a number of, of um, business and human rights uh, violations or abuses, but these extractives that have been seen as being of a particular um, increasing yeah, degradation or increasing uh, in terms of the risk towards defenders. And then quickly on that, uh, yeah, thanks, Uchiro. And then the, the, the environmental human rights defenders, absolutely, the Special Rapporteur on, on Human Rights Defenders has just released a report to say that this is an unprecedented year in terms of the deaths of human rights defenders. So it's it, it's 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 accelerating and our response needs to accelerate with it. I should say that some of our colleagues here on the call have been part of a UN wide effort because this is, of course, UNDP is, is, is has a huge responsibility here, but it is a UN wide effort to respond to this uh, very worrying trend. And so there is guidance being developed, uh, almost finished 
to be disseminated globally for all UN agencies about how to deal with this issue. And again, there are some nuances to, to environmental human rights defenders that we're grappling with, that we're, we're adapting to. Uh, in particular, the complicitness of the private sector. And of course, that's nothing new. But again, what we're seeing is it's much worse or in, in many cases really exacerbating the situation for environmental human rights defenders. And there is also this, this additional element I mentioned before about some of the, the, the technical nature of the work that environmental human rights defenders are involved in in terms of measuring measuring certain environmental degradation, pollution, or on even understanding it. And so this has kind of adapted how we have to respond to it. But just to say that there is a UN-wide process that UNDP is contributing to hugely to respond to this. Uh, it's not just a UNDP issue, but we will absolutely have to play our part. And to echo Tim's uh, comments, that it is it goes back to that institutional uh, reform efforts as well. They have to be part of the, the longer term picture, but, but not to ignore the short term responses that are required. And, and, and this UN-wide guidance is going to help us get there. Um, but thank you very much for the two very helpful questions and, and points. Well, thank you so much, Sean, uh, for that. Uh, uh, Cassandra, would you uh, like to come in uh, if you don't like to share any thoughts on the Excuse questions? Me, thank you. Uh, I don't have anything to add to that. Excellent, um, excellent answers by Tim and Sean and their depth of institutional knowledge. I could listen to them for, for hours. So no, I don't have anything to add. Yeah. Uh, thanks, Cassandra. I just would like to also bring it to the discussion. Um, uh, I think uh, uh, Tim and Sean mentioned about the conflict UNDP has, uh, how much advocacy it would do on some of these issues because it's not an uh, international NGO uh, to do that, but also it has its own program realities. Uh, with regard to extractive industries, it's also about an the dimension we did not talk that much today. Uh, if it's going to work with the extractive industries in a small way in ensuring certain kinds of jobs are secured, then it's also difficult for UNDP to take up that advocacy on uh, some of these uh, very sensitive and controversial issues as such. Um, but just with that, I would like to go to Faustina, uh, over to you for your uh, comments and questions. Um, I think uh, they answered a couple of my questions on environmental justice, but I was thinking particularly about women environmental uh, defenders. Uh, they've suffered a lot, especially in the Amazon, in certain parts of Africa. Women have also been denied by the extractive industries of their little farms um, that they used to feed their families and no compensation whatsoever. And these women cannot afford the huge, you know, fees that are charged by lawyers and governments have also neglected them. And I'm happy that it has been recognized that this year, a lot of environmental uh, defenders have been killed and have been maimed and have been driven away from their land. And it keeps going on and on and on and on, you know. So the United Nations itself, should really take this issue up seriously and do something about it, particularly women environmental defenders. They are doing their widow's might. They are just protecting their small farms and small property and small homelands. But these are poor women who are killed each and every time because they are talking against what the big extractive industries particularly are doing to them. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Faustina, for uh, bringing back again the important issue of environmental human rights defenders. Um, I just uh, would like to also draw your attention to the Access to Justice Global Thematic Evaluation our office conducted very recently, uh, which also points to opportunities for UNDP to much more strongly engage uh, in, uh, in this area uh, of the, uh, with regard to the safety of uh, environmental defenders. I think the number of the people who are getting killed is increasing by day. And I think it's upon UNDP as well as all UN agencies uh, to uh, work together on, on this important issue. Uh, any thoughts, colleagues, uh, uh, over to you again, um, um, uh, the, the panel, Tim, Sean and Cassandra, on the question uh, Faustina raised, uh, any other uh, any other uh, studies or any other perspective you want to share how UNDP would move forward on uh, on particularly um, uh, addressing the issue of the safety of environmental uh, uh, defenders? 
maybe um, uh, just briefly, and then I look forward to comments from my co-panelists. It, it, it's um, I, I I don't I don't want to leave the wrong impression for participants. So there was a lot more that UNDP and as Sean said, the UN together um, needs to be doing in this space. At the same time, there's lots and lots of work that are that is going on. It's not always branded as environmental justice work um, uh, for many reasons, uh, but just a few examples. So UNDP has one of the largest, perhaps the largest portfolio of work dedicated to forests. So we've heard many of the environmental defenders are, are, are living in or near or uh, dependent on forest resources, whether than the Amazon or the Congo Basin uh, or any of the other large or small forest basins. There's a huge body of work around forests and it's been a pioneer area of work for UNDP and the UN system when it comes to, uh, again, those environmental social standards, governance standards, excuse me, engagement with the private sector. And uh, one thing we haven't mentioned is the establishment of grievance mechanisms. Um, now, I don't want to suggest that grievance mechanisms at the national level. So just because UNDP has our own systems of standards, UNDP is also working with governments and um, stakeholder groups and the private sector to establish national systems of safeguards uh, and, and which uh, uh, within which grievance mechanisms are an important part of that justice chain uh, or that justice value chain, um, uh, which, which, which is a bit underserved in many communities. So that's one example. And I, and I don't want to go on too long, but there's similar um, types of work going on in linked areas around sustainable land management, around um, uh, all these issues are connected, uh, particularly when it comes from a gender perspective. So you have um, uh, uh, rights to tenure, land, land rights and land tenure rights, in, in which um, not only is there an issue of environmental justice, but there's a systemic issue, challenge, problem of uh, gender, uh, the, the rights of women are not being met. In over 100 countries, women still do not have the right to inherit property or land um, when their husband or spouse dies. So this is a huge body of work we're working on and it's also closely tied to our work on sustainable food and agricultural systems, where again, the gender component is central, where again, issues of environmental justice are critical. And there's a huge focus, not only on, but also on the procedural rights of access to information, um, meaningful engagement in, in relevant policy discussions, and perhaps the area we need to do most is this access to recourse, the access to justice, uh, where there is some UNDP programming and broader UN programming, but much more could be and should be done in this space. Over. Thanks. Uh, uh, any other thought? Any other thoughts, uh, Sean? Uh, to share, uh, I would like to open it up. Uh, Sean, others, anybody can come in. I think let, let Cassian come in there. I think uh, there's a okay. hand up there. Absolutely. Cassian, over to you for your question or, or, or comments or sharing information. Maybe it was up by accident. I can, jump in, I can jump in very quickly. just wanted to respond to Festina's point very pointedly and say, yes, absolutely. And, and just to say that one really important new area, I want to say new because it's been going on for years, but again, a new framing and not everything is about framing. I must have said that word about 20 times now, so apologies. But it, another way of understanding it is we're diving a bit deeper into the issues and certain issues. And we're getting closer to, I would say, to what some of the bigger kind of structural issues are. And, and one of them is, is, is the private sector focus. And it's in particular with the private sector misbehaving. So again, thinking about uh, you know women human rights defenders, um, you know a case just in Kenya only recently about uh, on Del Monte and pineapple farms, and and so it's good we're finally starting to hold more or give more responsibility and accountability towards the businesses because there's no doubt that these issues long preceded. So you know gender inequality. Um, harassment, violence, long preceded what you know where we are now. But the reality is heightened investment, and this has certainly exacerbated the situation where a huge amount of economic activity is is increasing the 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 tensions, and it's increasing um, what's at stake basically. So one of the most important things is to start holding businesses more responsible and not allowing them the opportunity to use weak regulation, weak governance structures to basically say, you know, this, this is a, a, an issue between uh, people and their government. It's not. It's absolutely UN guiding principles on business and human rights are unequivocal in, sh in, in sharing that the businesses have a responsibility to respect human rights. And it's an important uh, 
focus um, that we're, we're really, um, we're increasing our focus on. We have a large, one of the largest programs on business and human rights globally, uh, UNDP. And specifically what we've seen is a really welcome trend coming out of the EU, which is a directive on mandatory human rights due diligence. So this is no longer an option. It's no longer CSR to say I'm doing what I can in, in countries where I operate. It's now going to be, hopefully in the next few months, a mandatory requirement for large businesses in Europe offering overseas. We hope that trend really it follows because all this does not just happen between human rights defenders and governments. It happens and with there are businesses from other countries, extraterritorial obligations that they have to acknowledge or they have to uh, uh, respond to the, the responsibilities to, to respect human rights. And finally, just say UNDP, we are working with the UN Working Group on Business and Human Rights to develop a guide on uh, human rights and environmental due diligence so that maybe businesses won't follow it in terms of we'll always have some businesses behaving well and others not, but at least we'll have some kind of reference against which to measure the performance of businesses when they operate in these, in these contexts to say whether they're doing it right or not. Because at the moment, uh, they really are getting away with, with too much and, and, and not upholding their responsibilities in the UN guiding principles. And thank you for the question. Thank you. Yeah, thank, uh, thank you, Sean. Uh, before we go to Tim, uh, Terence, uh, uh, can you um, uh, share your thoughts or question? Uh, yes, thank you. Can you hear me? Yes. Yeah, so just to build on the example of the, the small grants program is now and it's, it's been implemented for 30 years by UNDP. So this has really supported environmental justice across many of the conventions. But to give you just one example of the type of um, foundational support that was provided over the last 15 years for the um, uh, Stockholm Convention on POPs, many governments had not um, previously ratified the Convention on, on uh, Persistent Organic uh, Pollutants and through uh, partnering with non-state actors through grant making through the SGP, this in many cases led governments to then take cognizance of the risk of, of, of POPs uh, and then to sign the Stockholm uh, Convention. So um, the, this mechanism of, 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 of coalition building um, through partnerships with non-state actors is one of the ways in which I think UNDP can build awareness around some of these uh, uh, key conventions on, on planetary um, uh, crises. And I would just add that uh, with the new uh, global biodiversity framework that was uh, adopted in December 2022 last year, there will likely be an, an explicit indicator on environmental rights defenders. So under the, the auspices of the, the CBD as a convention, um, there will be a, a need to uh, support governments around uh, the monitoring frameworks on uh, EHRD. So there will be a, a very clear mandate for UNDP to work on that as part of its uh, engagement with those conventions. So thank you. Over. Uh, thank you so much, Terence, for sharing that. Uh, before I turn to Tim, uh, just one question from my side, because uh, in your earlier uh, um, uh, introductory observations, you uh, brought in uh, environmental safeguards and standards. Uh, your reflections on as a tool, how is it working? Um, and uh, do you think there are areas where, where that can be strengthened because that tool is not just for UNDB, but also for all UN agencies? Uh, and also a little bit more reflection also on the data for environmental decision making, environmental justice decision making, which earlier uh, Jessica also raised about. Um, so over to you, Tim. Thanks. And I, I, have, I, I have an eye on the clock, so very briefly. Um, one of the comments in the chat box talked about implementation and whether it's with safeguards or other areas of environmental justice, this is the implementation gap, right? So we have fairly strong normative uh, uh, frameworks in place when it comes to safeguards or due diligence or many of the other issues. And in parallel, national governments have often some good policies in place, but it's the implementation gap that we need to work on. Data, there's a lot going on. Just to say one example is the Biodiversity Lab, which is a UN initiative that's designed to put more information in, into the place of hands of both local communities and governments to do many things, including to advance environmental justice. Three forward-looking points, and then th that'll be it very quickly. What I'm glad that you came in, Terrence. Um, Terrence, you and colleagues have been really doing a lot of uh, amazing, innovative, leading work on indigenous peoples and local communities. So just a shout out to that amazing work which is of course so central to what we've been talking about. And two other final forward-looking points, um, environmental justice conceptually could be considered a very important foundational pillar of a broader set of environmental governance issues. Um, and UNDP is developing this broader environmental 
governance um, strategy. And uh, starting next month, there'll be a, 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 a series of consultations that, that will allow us to sensitize and, um, and uh, take forward that work. And similarly, UNDP has a new nature pledge. Uh, this new UNDP nature pledge is also very much formally centered around issues of environmental justice and, and other themes. And there'll be ongoing um, uh, efforts to uh, socialize this work within the UNDP and partner context going forward. So I just wanted to give those uh, those heads up. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Tim. Uh, uh, just maybe if uh, if it's okay with you, we may take one round of questions or one more question. Uh, Chinidu, uh, would you like to come in? Okay. Um, Chinidu, do you have a question? Or Kasin, would you like to come in? Cassie, uh, I see your hands up. Uh, if you have a question, do come in. Otherwise, we can go for uh, concluding remarks. Hello? Yes. Can you hear me? Yes, yes. Yeah, thank you so much. Uh, my question is already mentioned in the chat, but uh, I just to, to ask, uh, to request something from you, from UNDP. Uh, on this topic, I was made uh, a, a report regarding this topic. So I'd like to, to ask you uh, if you can follow uh, my report, if you can follow my report, so that it will be uh, good for me and for you uh, to fulfill and to support your, uh, your topic of today and your aim to, to protect environment justice. Thank you so much. Thank you, Kasin, uh, for that. Uh, Chinedu, would you like to come in? Um, Okay, I, I guess we don't have a question. So uh, let's uh, uh, just for concluding uh, remarks, Cassandra, uh, 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 can I start with you uh, for your closing uh, observations on the discussion today? I just think it was an immensely rich discussion. And, and as I said, it could probably go on for hours. I could just listen to some of these initiatives and that rich depth of history. Uh, um, you know, and, and obviously there's so much work ongoing in this space. It's, it's just really, it's really exciting and it's great to, great to hear, hear all the work. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Chris. Sean, um, your concluding thoughts? Uh, no, just to say that that this uh, a, that the human rights defenders piece is a huge piece, and I'm very happy that it's been focused on it, and and we are absolutely prioritizing it. I think as a UN wide effort, it's being prioritized, but as UNDP, uh, we have both the the short development future series piece coming out soon, just about how this might look in our programming, and then a, a deeper dive into what we'll do about it next year in terms of bigger programming, and, and we have uh, uh, some exciting ideas around that. But thank you for raising that. That's certainly a very strong takeaway from this. Discussion. Question. Thank you. Thanks. Uh, thanks, Sean. Uh, Tim. Uh... Thanks very much. I think there was a, a late question about how we work with UN agencies that got some traction. Just to add, um, UNDP, of course, prioritize our partnerships with, with, with everyone, including and especially sister UN agencies. So whether it's UN Environmental Program or UNHCHR, um, we are also working closely with several UN Secretary General initiatives in the human rights space and linked linked spaces, working very closely with uh, UNDCO, um, who coordinates UN system-wide work on UN, on UN reforms with uh, resident coordinators and UN country teams. So a lot, a lot ha is, is going on um, in terms of collaboration with, with sister agencies. We work closely with UN Environmental Management Group and so on. So. Um, I just wanted to respond to that question and say thanks for everyone for the great comments and questions and looking forward to taking this uh, work forward. Thank you, Tim. Um, I, I take this opportunity to thank you all for participating in this discussion. I do agree with um, uh, what our colleagues shared that this is such a um, um, uh, a deep and uh, important topic uh, which cannot be completed. The discussion cannot be completed on uh, in one hour. Um, I, I agree with Sean. Uh, for me also, the takeaway is 
how um, uh, which uh, this discussion raised how how we can uh, work to ensure environmental defenders are human rights defenders are safe uh, how uh, all agencies can work more towards ensuring that is one of the big takeaways uh, and also how we can focus back on already existing tools uh, to ensure environmental justice um, uh, issues are taken forward uh, as well. Uh, I would like to again thank you very much for participating in this discussion. Thanks to Cassandra for and uh, Jose for working on this uh, lessons uh, uh, reflection and also for Tim and Sean for joining in this discussion and thank you all for very much for joining today. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thanks. Bye. Thank you. Thanks for everyone. Thank you. Bye. Thank you.